Those of you who have listened to my interviews will have heard me mention my good friend, Dr. Ronald Cap. And Dr. Ron, as I call him, is one of my sources for medical information that I sometimes touch upon in my writings. In my book, A Master's Guide to the Way of the Warrior, I talk about the nervous system, the endocrine system, and many facets of anatomy. When I write this material, I first research the hell out of it. Then, I run it by Dr. Ron for fact-checking and further research ideas. Last week we were talking, and I brought up my pet peeve that I call the tyranny of words. Why do words have such a huge impact on human behavior? I cite one of innumerable possible examples, the First World War. What motivated a half million American farm boys and baker's sons to travel 6,000 miles to brutally butcher a half million German farm boys and baker's sons that had never harmed a hair on an American head. Now, after a hundred years of hindsight, we know that World War I was utterly pointless and unnecessary. All that death, blood, gore, pain, suffering, amputations, disfigurements, blindness, sadness, broken families, alcoholism, depression, morphine addiction, PTSD, not to mention all the taxpayer money that was stolen, was all for nothing. Nothing for the average American, but for the bankers and the military corporations. It was a bonanza of riches, and they got to ram through a form of legalized robbery never imagined before. Income tax. Why? Because some psychopath stood on a podium and spoke words into a microphone. And then some psychopaths printed some words in a newspaper. Well, our talk inspired Dr. Ron to find an answer, and a few days later, he sent me the following essay. Now, it's a little on the technical side, but afterwards, I will offer a summary and show how it ties into spiritual training and discipline. The Tyranny of Words by Dr. Ron Cap, M.D. I have often wondered why humanity's history is filled with stories of war after war after war. Why can we not have world peace? I now know a logical answer to that perplexing question that has baffled philosophers, politicians, and often even the common man on the street. I came to this answer in a moment of insight. I study the human brain for a living. The human brain, that two pounds of complex, interconnected, synaptic, gelatinous mass filled with neurohormones that still baffles and confounds modern science. Our brain has been often described as the final frontier of medicine, our last virtually unexplored ocean of cellular complexity that is now revealing profound secrets of who we are, where we came from, and perhaps someday in answer to why we are here in the first place. Mankind evolved over millions of years, from the most primitive slime to the most complex synergistic physiology ever imagined. Our brain alone is composed of over 89 billion individual neuronal cells, each with upwards of 10,000 or more synaptic connections in a spider-like web that produces consciousness, deep thought, and a panoply of emotions that run the gamut from love to hatred. That cellular hardware responds to a cauldron of biochemical systems that connect our microbiome to our heart, our lymphatics to our muscles, our periphery to our central nervous system. The Australopithecus brain of Lucy 
was only 750 cubic centimeters in size. Cro-Magnon's brain exceeded 1,500 cubic centimeters. And while ours now only approximates 1,300 centimeters on average, it is our magnificent and refined prefrontal cortex that allows us to have reached the top rung of the food chain. And yet we have war after war. The answer to this profound paradox rests in our innate and inherited physiology. As does every organism from the lowly virus to man, we are meant to reproduce and survive. This is our destiny as a species. Survival is an instinct. It has been inbred over eons of evolution into each and every cell of our body. Our DNA has a destiny to reproduce, as does the exogenously derived and synergistic mitochondria DNA of our cells that give us our ATP energy. And so too our independent microbiome DNA. Also true and also critical to our survival, the ever-changing bacterial microbiome of our gastrointestinal tract that contains more cells than the entire universe of stars, more neurohormones than sand on the beach, and more immune power than ever imagined. All that human complexity evolved over millions and millions of years simply from a desire to survive. And the primitive control mechanism resides in a part of our brain known as the limbic system, the amygdala. There had to be a control mechanism, some way to make it all work. Survival is primitive, emotions even more so. Minute quantities of neurohormones drive our actions. Neurohormonal control of survival destiny. Enter the evolution of the human brain. Our fabulous and continuing to evolve prefrontal cortex was a much later evolutionary adaptation as we descended from the tree to savanna and became the bipedal creature we are today. Although evolution may often make mistakes and go down blind alleys and dead ends, our primitive limbic genetics persists for we still need to reproduce and survive as a species. Our prefrontal cortex evolved and still continues its inevitable destiny as the master of intelligence, thought, and creativity. Although we use the words of language as easily as water flows down a mountainside, the inherent complexity of that simple act is the incipient spark of war. Words that flow, genetics that control. Yes, we have isolated the gene of war, the warrior gene and more, and have now isolated the genetics of anxiety, depression, anger, and today even the epigenetic control of Alzheimer's. The warrior gene identified in 1993 in a antisocial Dutch family on our X chromosome produces monamine oxidase A that upsets the balance of dopamine, serotonin, and more. Or perhaps the CDH13 gene involved in intercellular signaling in several psychiatric illnesses such as autism, bipolar, schizophrenia, and psychopathology. But what does it all mean? Is genetics our destiny, or can mankind override our inherited burden of caveman survival? Ah, therein lies my nugget of insight. A spark of thought that was first described by the ancient Egyptians, refined by George Ivanovich Gurdjieff in his quote, The first reason for people's slavery is our ignorance and above all, our ignorance of ourselves. 
and today infinitely solidified by Lee Yeoman in his thoughts about the French philosopher Foucault. Quote, but I have also come to think that there is great power in words and mightier than the sword. Foucault speaks of multiple sources of power and multiple hierarchies. The more parallel hierarchies, the better. The more viewpoints, the more nuance we comprehend. Perhaps I just love words and believe in the perfect placement of a preposition or just the right adjective. Is it the poet in me that dreams he can win over, like Benjamin Franklin, the masses with eloquence? Of course, he was loved more in France. Certainly, the tyranny of words can be powerful, but why? My neurological nugget says that the words we speak, write, and even think are processed by that prefrontal cortex that I mentioned above, the thinking intellectual part of our brain. But, and it's a big but, the meaning of those words is processed by our primitive limbic neurons of the amygdala and the caudate, and the entire emotional survival system of our brain. The meaning becomes survival. My Nugget A cave-dwelling family was sitting around a small fire. Someone, it mattered not who, uttered an unintelligible sound, perhaps an ugh, maybe even a word. As the others listened, the sound of ugh registered in their emotional centers. Their basal ganglia cells were stimulated. That person sounded ugh. And then by happenstance, that same ugh voice brought to the cave some food. A leader was born. A leader will help us survive. A leader will show us the way. A leader can do no wrong. Humans, by nature, are followers. We seek the leader to lead. Everyone wants survival. However, mankind's prefrontal cortex was yet to develop in that enlightened cave. Following was easy, for most had little thought of anything but survival and follow the leader. It happened then because there was no neuronal connection between the emotional neurons and the prefrontal thinking neurons. Survival came before thinking. It had to. Those prehistoric sounds precursors to words and language were the means of survival. The same exact, unchanged, unaltered, and prehistoric neurology persists today. The meaning of words become registered in our primitive emotional limbic system. There is no connection to the prefrontal thought processes of analysis and interpretation. There is then a profound neurological disconnect between these two cerebral regions, the limbic versus the prefrontal cortex, and the limbic emotions win out every time, for that is what survival of the species demands. And for that we have war after war after war. The tyranny of words draws the followers like a bear to honey. There is no thought, no analysis, no reflection. Warriors for the entire history of mankind have been blindly driven by their primitive brain cells being stimulated by a few choice words. No amount of thought, debate, logic, or intellectual discussion will ever dissuade a warrior from his or her survival beliefs. That is the tyranny we must all overcome. Summary In my book, The Way of the Warrior, I talk about the fact that humans have three individual brains, often called centers in various spiritual philosophies. They are roughly defined as the intellectual, the emotional, and the instinctive centers. One result of having three brains 
is that we all suffer, to some degree, from multiple personality disorder. In psychiatry, the treatment for MPD is to integrate the various personalities. In spiritual training, the treatment is to integrate the three brains into a single unit. Both have the goal of helping the person to become one. As Dr. Ron stated, language is processed by both the intellectual center, or the prefrontal cortex, and the emotional center, or limbic systems. As I wrote in my book, the three centers work at different speeds. The fastest is the instinctive center. The next fastest is the emotional center. And the slowest is the intellectual. This is where part of the problem lies. Long before the intellectual center can analyze the logic and rationale behind the words, the emotional center has already responded to key words that triggered a pre-programmed response. This is often called a knee-jerk reaction and why people lose their temper. The programmed response is so intense it drowns out the input from the prefrontal cortex. It short-circuits the ability to think clearly. This fact is the basis for the combat strategy of antagonizing your opponent. If your enemy is enraged, he can't think clearly and won't see the ambush, the trap, or other subtle strategy you are using. Fear, anxiety, and stress are other programmed responses that will affect your ability to think. This is why our governments and their media propaganda divisions are constantly promoting fear porn. By inducing constant fear, our governments hope you will not be able to think rationally and figure out that we are ruled by psychopaths intent on our slavery. There is one more piece to the puzzle of human behavior. In my chapter on visualization, I cite the well-documented research that shows the brain cannot differentiate between external sensations and internal visualization. There is a slight mistake in this statement. It's not the entire brain that cannot differentiate it. It's the limbic and nervous system. The prefrontal cortex can. This is why visualization works. The intellectual center can create images that can train the emotional responses because the limbic system interprets the imagery as reality. This is the crux of the problem. Unless a person has self-awareness, words are reality. This leads to the absurd concept that people are offended by words, that certain words are a crime, hate speech, that words are assault and abuse of human rights, and now even silence is violence. Words are at best an abstraction. The fact that people cannot differentiate between reality and words inspired sophistry and the psychopathic science of neuro-linguistic programming. Psychopaths study which words and combination of words will best trigger the pre-programmed response so as to more effectively manipulate people. I and many other truth warriors have been saying that the war between humanity and the parasite psychopaths is in great part a spiritual war. Unless you follow a spiritual path that seeks to integrate the three centers, that seeks to make you one, you will always be a victim of lies, propaganda, and manipulation. Those that do not follow such a path are worse than useless in this great battle for humanity and will eventually become collateral damage. The Tyranny of Words, Part 2, by Dr. Ron Cap, M.D. 
forward. In part two of this series of scientific essays, Dr. Cap talks about how the disjointed integration between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system leads to the limbic system running out of control and causing stress. Dr. Cap, in his research on aging and disease, identifies stress as the major producer of both illness and aging. I will offer my summary at the end. Optimal brain wellness requires that the prefrontal cortex is appropriately communicating with the more primitive neurons of the limbic system. Additionally, there is also a lack of synaptic integration between the hippocampus, the primary memory center, and the prefrontal cortex, cognitive processing. As outlined in Part 1, the common psychiatric imbalance of being unable to logically evaluate, debate, and discuss reality is severely impaired in many people. In essence, this impairment prevents the prefrontal cortex from communicating with the more primitive brain functions of emotions, the limbic system, that drive species survival. This disjointed brain physiology leads to many medical and psychiatric illnesses, all of which are manifest via a lack of empathy for others, a focus on the self-emollient of ego only, and a complete inability to examine and potentially alter ingrained beliefs that have been proven illogical and false. This quirk of genetic evolution has profound implications for personal health. It is an obvious medical truism that when the human organism is in fight-or-flight mode with an overactive autonomic nervous response, increased epinephrine and neoepinephrine release, that the cortisol response of the adrenal glands is also in overdrive. This is the classic stress response so well described by the Hungarian physician Hans Selye in his 1964 book, The Stress of Life. His theory known as the General Adaptation Syndrome has been proven valid not only by Selye when he was a research endocrinologist at McGill University, but also by hundreds to thousands of peer-reviewed published scientific studies. In other words, stress kills. Many experts are of the opinion that stress can be implicated in the etiology of over 90% of all human illness. Consider hypertension and cardiovascular disease or endothelial disruption and gastrointestinal illness, or metabolic derangement and type 2 diabetes and obesity, or hypothalamic pituitary imbalance with such diverse impacts as anxiety, depression, insomnia, and so on. Chronic stress comes in many forms. It is defined as chronic demands that threaten to exceed resources. From a biological perspective, this is most commonly from an environmental stress, such as poor nutrition, poor sleep, various toxicity exposures. But modern society adds on such stresses as family, work, financial, housing, health, and even CNN and Fox News. Prolonged activation turns into a pathological state. A normal response over a long time frame wreaks havoc on our cardiovascular, our neuroendocrine, and immune systems. Wellness, longevity, and optimal brain performance demand homeostasis. Homeostasis is all about survival. We have an acute stress response and it is normal. To avoid being eaten by a saber-toothed tiger requires a strong stress response. However, once the tiger is avoided, the acute event is over, stress dissipates, and the organism returns to a homeostatic baseline. 
homeostasis refers to the condition that all physiologic parameters be maintained within a narrow range. However, that does not happen when stress becomes a chronic driver of personality and behavior. Everyone knows that chronic stress kills, but why? The why is answered by the concept put forth by Sterling and Iyer, known as allostasis. The biology of allostasis refers to the adjustments that the human body makes to any challenge over the entire lifetime of the organism. Adapting to a challenge demands the synchronous activation of many systems, neuronal, hormonal, and immunological. Allostasis begins in the brain and requires the integration of both limbic and prefrontal neurons. Each of us responds to an event in an individualized and unique manner based on ingrained beliefs and experiences. For example, as an ER doctor, I see blood and respond one way, whereas the patient sees blood and responds differently. Same blood, different response. Allostasis is about how we interpret a situation and how we adapt. Such individualized adaptations are the key to how chronic disease develops over many years. In other words, our allostatic response to stress can become deleterious over time, irreversible if prolonged, and even lead to premature death. Stress that continues year after year leads to disease. That is obvious and well proven. When the human body does not return to homeostasis and equilibrium, then the adaptations that the body makes will, without exception, cause cellular damage. In other words, allostasis can become detrimental. Therefore, Measuring the amount of continued and chronic stress that results from stressful situations when the body fails to adapt, fails to shut off acutely aroused systems, or when the response is deficient will cause disease. This is known as the allostatic load. When the allostatic load builds up and causes irreversible cellular damage, that is known as allostatic overload. The result is chronic disease and also such physiological distresses that result in obvious insomnia, anxiety, depression, or sometimes even suicide. Enter the doctors with an armamentarium of pills and potions that include anxiolytics, antidepressants, beta blockers, anti-diabetic medicines, sleeping pills, or even anti-fat pills. It matters not, for these modern miracles do work. These secrets of science work by a multitude of mechanisms to modulate the activity of the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system and attempt to re-establish homeostasis of the patient. Unfortunately, most come with significant side effects deleterious long-term consequences, and sometimes even death. This is nothing new. Even Voltaire wrote, Despite the fact that the patient was seen by the best medical minds in Europe, he survived. The one pill, one disease, allopathic solution does work well, I'll bet with the ubiquitous side effects and the deleterious consequences. However, 21st century medicine has moved on and now offers a far different solution. The revolutionary concept of functional medicine asks the fundamental question of why is this patient sick in the first place and what is, are, the root causes? That is a much different analysis than asking what pill should I give this patient? Patients are not deficient in acetaminophen or Tylenol or display a penicillin deficiency or lack an antidepressant like Zoloft. Far from it. 
patients have a root cause of illness that has impacted their homeostatic balance, affected their allostatic load, and perhaps, most importantly of all, disrupted their neurocormonal connections between the primitive limbic system and their prefrontal cortex. Unfortunately, as a consequence of the tyranny of words, just telling the patients who need this understanding the most will never come to grips with this insidious assault on their health and wellness. The catch-22 of disease has become a downward spiral for millions of Americans, for they block themselves as a consequence of the disease itself. However, for many others, there is great news. There are valid scientific treatments and prescribed modalities that can and do counteract this evolutionary conundrum. Natural products abound. Lifestyle modifications and even modern technology offer humanity a variety of solutions never before available. Enhanced wellness prolonged longevity, and optimal brain performance is within our grasp. We simply have to open our minds to science, personal change, and opportunity. The challenge is yours. Summary In my book, A Master's Guide to the Way of the Warrior, I wrote a chapter on the two demons every warrior must face and overcome pain, and fear. These two limbic reactions create what is known as a negative biofeedback loop. Pain creates fear, fear creates stress, and stress reinforces the pain response. And round and round it goes. Dr. Cap shows this negative feedback loop on a grander scale that affects the human organism on an ongoing basis ingraining the negative loop into our organism, which is the root cause of disease, aging, and eventually death. One of the solutions is known as signal dampening, reducing the intensity of both the pain and the stress response. As Dr. Cap mentioned, this can be done with drugs, such as painkillers and antidepressants. But in addition to all the harmful side effects of these drugs, they also damage the sense organism of the body. A better solution is to integrate the prefrontal cortex, your mind, which can dampen these signals without drugs through various exercises and methods. The good news is that Dr. Kapp has spent the last 20 years researching and developing a program to train the brain that he currently only teaches to medical and health professionals that he calls optimal brain wellness. In the next essay, Dr. Cap will touch on some of these methods. Forward. In part one, Dr. Cap explained how a lack of integration between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system allows words to have a physiological reaction on the human organism akin to reality. In part two, he explained that the root cause of disease and aging is stress, much of which is caused by words. In this final part, Dr. Ron lists many of the toxins that cause stress and disease and aging and how to heal yourself. The forms of stress that affect the human brain are many. From the glyphosate on your blueberries to the coconut whipping cream on your pumpkin pie, from the diesel exhaust of that 18-wheeler to the chlorine in your shower, it matters little from where or what poison has impacted your body. Living on planet Earth today with our nearly 100,000 man-made and highly toxic chemicals, or from being bombarded by the cellular disrupting EMFs of TV, cell phone, and computers, we did not evolve under these chronic stressors. 
Everyone's burden is different, unique, and personalized. So too the treatment. Even the burden of words that we listen to on a daily basis affect each of us individually and in a body-specific manner. It has been said that all stress arises from within and that our reactions and our ability to de-stress and detoxify is individually controlled. How we respond to any words of tyranny is up to each of us, but that response is in fact based on the new science of amygdala to prefrontal cortex nexus. Therefore, optimal brain health demands optimal neuronal connections, enhanced neurogenesis, and appropriate levels of neurotransmitters, thus a personalized treatment plan. Here's a brief account sent to me on how individually specific and personally unique the stress response can be. Quote, so I myself have experienced the detrimental health effects of too much stress. Back in 2004, I was completely overloaded at work. They piled on way too many projects for me to oversee. I started having a shoulder twitch. My shoulder would suddenly jump and I couldn't stop or hide it. Then one day, I fainted. Just out of nowhere, I completely blacked out. Luckily, I was not hurt when I fell. Anyway, I had all kinds of examinations done to try and find out why I had fainted. And they couldn't find anything wrong. No tumors in my brain, my heart checked out fine, etc. Then the doctor asked me, Are you under a lot of stress? I answered, Yes, definitely. He then told me that stress could do strange things to the body and that I should do something to reduce my stress level. So I went to my boss and told him I couldn't continue to try and handle the workload. It was just too much. Luckily, they listened to me and took away about a third of the projects I was trying to lead. Within a few months, the shoulder twitches went away and I was able to start sleeping better." End quote. If only it was always so easy to counter the tyranny of words. Less work, less stress. Unfortunately, it is not always clear-cut, and ferreting out the many causes of stress is often fraught with confusion and anger. Patience is a virtue. Enter the doctor with the silver bullet, sleeping pill, or antidepressant, and voila, the symptom is resolved but sadly not the cause, only the symptom. Little can be resolved until the cause, the instigating factor, the etiology so to speak, has been identified and lessened. Detoxification is paramount in all treatment. We may cut out the tumor, but if the patient continues to smoke, wellness is elusive. We may prescribe insulin to the type 2 diabetic but if the patient continues the lifestyle that caused the disease, progressive deterioration accelerates year after year. We may change our diet, but if we keep our alcohol bin stocked, Alzheimer's looms scarily on the horizon. Although treatment should be personalized, individualized, unique, and specific, it is also possible to undertake a generalized plan of attack to circumvent the tyranny, the stress, or even the cellular damaging effects of the multinational chemical company's plot to kill us all. Treatment. What can be done to alleviate the allostatic overload is an exciting, fun, and life-altering time of experimentation. Similar to the societal experiment of the 60s when peace, love and harmony made Woodstock a lifestyle, today's desire for wellness, longevity and optimal brain performance draws many with the hope that natural products, safe technology and improved machine learning with patient-specific algorithms will lead to a bright and healthy future. 
In the process of seeking wellness, everyone learns more about that elusive mind-body connection and what it means to overcome the tyranny of words, toxicity, stress, and more. Modulating the activity of the prefrontal cortex to the limbic system, assisting the prefrontal neurons with an improved top-down control or attenuating the amygdala's influence as we dampen the bottom-up control will mitigate the pathophysiological harms of living on today's planet Earth. The simple and well-known techniques of no longer watching CNN or Fox News, taking a daily walk, sleeping a full eight hours without interruptions of sleep apnea, spending dopamine-boosting time with friends and family, avoiding as much as possible the ubiquitous toxins and poisons from those foreign and domestic chemical factories that overload our liver and increase beta amyloid production in our hippocampus, or perhaps even changing to a Mediterranean-style diet with only a small glass of French resveratol, those are the treatments everyone knows about. The beauty of modern science has demonstrated the profound wisdom of nature. A fundamental driving force for all health is based on the concept of interconnected systems. In other words, an event in one system affects many other distant body systems. The pressure of stress can therefore be manifest in a variety of tissues and organs. For example, the stress of too much work, while it could show up as a shoulder twitch, it could have just as easily manifested as anxiety or depression, or hypertension and heart disease, or even function as the incipient factor for a cancer. The uniqueness of each human, like snowflakes in winter, present as something special for each of us. But always remember that we are holistic beings and everything is connected to everything else. However, what all have in common is the role of the brain. All stress and all disease are under the umbrella of brain health. I believe that a logical solution is an a la carte selection that is facetious yet minimizes side effects and long-term repercussions. In other words, what might be needed by one person may not be needed by the other person. Many of these natural products can be used in a standalone fashion. Others may be integrated with standard allopathic therapies. The tyranny of words is a decoupling of different areas in the brain. Quite commonly, this is a response to stress and a lack of homeostasis with subsequent disequilibrium in the neurochromonal control of behavior. Natural therapies can gently guide the human brain and either upregulate or downregulate the connections between the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system. Maybe, just maybe, there's a solution to why we have war after war after war. That is the challenge of society. Summary Dr. Cap has explained that the source of disease and even aging is a result of toxicity. We are being poisoned both externally and internally. External poison comes in the form of exposure to chemicals in our environment. These include fluoride in our water, heavy metals in the air spread by chemtrails, pesticides on our fruits and vegetables, GMO foods that cause plants to create their own internal poison to resist bugs and bacteria, poison in your shampoo, soap, toothpaste, makeup, plastic water bottles, and sunscreen. Then there is the toxic poison of pharmaceuticals and the proven cancer-inducing effects of electromagnetic frequencies of Wi-Fi and now 5G. The treatment is something you've all heard a hundred times before. Drink lots of pure water, eat foods you've grown yourself or have sourced locally, don't take prescription drugs, 
Get rid of all the lotions and cleaners, laundry detergents, dryer sheets, and use only natural soap. Then throw away your smartphone, turn off your TV and computer, and finally spend some more time in nature. The second source of toxins comes from stress that is created internally by our mind through the medium of words. Through some strange quirk of evolution we don't really understand, our brains process words as reality. One theory that is echoed by many philosophers and spiritual teachers is that most people are under hypnosis, in a semi-trance state. It is like the Las Vegas show Hypnotist, that has members of the audience come up on stage, then when he snaps his finger and says the word chicken, they all start behaving like chickens. In a similar manner, the college professor snaps her finger and says, you're a socialist. Or the religious leader snaps his finger and says, you're a sinner. Or the TV spokesmodel snaps her finger and says, you're a consumer. The psychopaths that run things know all about the trans state that the mass of humanity is under and have perfected the art of hypnosis using words and images. They use this art to exploit and enslave humanity. It has gotten so bad that every exposure to popular culture creates cognitive dissonance between the reality we experience and the reality words have created. This is the source of the internal stress that is aging us before our time, growing cancers and tumors, eroding our joints and heart muscles, destroying our brain functions so we descend into senility and dementia. The preventative treatment is the ability to control your emotional reaction to words and examine data critically. Dr. Kaplan described this ability as a result of the integration between the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. Philosophers would describe this ability as being awake and aware. To find out more about Dr. Cap and his book on longevity and anti-aging, check the link in the description below. Thank you.